Our Old Testament reading assigned for today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, a steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. <clears throat> Perhaps if I were a more trusting person, I would stand before you a wealthier person. I get lots of chances to be wealthy. They come to me by email. <laughs> you probably don't know this because I assume these messages I get are privileged information, but Nigeria has a surprising number of princes and they are all offering to put money in my bank account. I could be a very wealthy person if I could just overcome this little issue I have about trust. Now, obviously, I am being ironic. Scams like this infamous Nigerian prince deal are what teach us to be cautious about whom we trust. And that's just the top layer. That's just the communications that are so obviously untrustworthy that we don't give them a second thought. The real mistrust in our society goes much deeper. We have a lot of fear. We fear we will be taken advantage of. We fear we will be hurt. With doubtful hearts, we weigh politicians' promises and even one another's professions of love. We have to protect our interests. It's every man for himself. And now, we savvy citizens of the 21st century open our Bibles to Isaiah and read the cry of the prophet. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come by wine and milk without money and without price. Reading through our cultural lens of mistrust, there's only one way to take this text. It has to be a scam. No wonder the church is a hard sell in today's society. Scriptures like these ask people to believe in promises that seem too good to be true. They require us to believe that God is wildly generous, giving of abundance beyond measure and without price. If our life on this earth has taught us anything, it's that there's no such thing as a free lunch. To surrender to this prophet's urgings, to place hope in his promises requires trust. And we live in a culture that fosters mistrust and insists that everyone must fend for himself. Now maybe the culture of Isaiah's day was different. Maybe it was more hopeful, more trusting, more community-spirited, or maybe not. We can say at least that the people described in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah had plenty to fear, and fear fosters mistrust. In Isaiah's day, the major power was Assyria. During the period of Isaiah's first 39 chapters, the mighty Assyrian army destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, leaving the tiny southern kingdom of Judah as the only remnant of the Israelites. Throughout those first 39 chapters, Judah trembles in anticipation of its own likely destruction. And the prophet is not doing much to soothe them. He decries the sins of a nation that has forgotten how to take care of its weakest members. He tells them what the Lord would have them do. Cease to do evil, he cries. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. 
But instead, he says, everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. It's every man for himself. And the wicked are in charge, plotting, says Isaiah, to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied and to deprive the thirsty of drink. In a culture like that, you could understand how even a very thirsty person might regard a cup of water with suspicion. In a culture where everyone has to fend for himself, why would anyone offer something freely to another? There's no such thing as a free lunch and probably no such thing as even a free cup of water, let alone wine and milk without price. You can imagine what might pass through this thirsty person's mind on hearing Isaiah's invitation to come to the waters. That invitation is a trick. And I will not take a chance on being tricked. I'll just get busy and find some water on my own and then I'll carry it over here to the corner and I'll drink it where no one can see me so that no one will ask me for any. Perhaps some of Isaiah's audience were thirsty not because there was no water, but because experience had taught them not to trust anyone who offered them a drink. You can understand the logic. If you have water and I don't, you don't gain any advantage in offering me a drink. So if you do offer me a drink, either it's a trick or else you're telling me that in some way my life matters to you. Which one am I likely to believe in a culture where everyone is living in fear and chasing after his own security? But let's pause and notice where this great invitation comes in the book of Isaiah. If in those first 39 chapters the people of Judah lived in fear and suspicion, if in those chapters the prophet decried their godlessness and their lack of care for one another, if in those chapters all seemed bleak, then it is a great relief to turn to the opening words of chapter 40, which are, Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. We have entered new territory. The section that begins with chapter 40 is sometimes known as Second Isaiah. It describes a later era, and its message is strikingly different. Not that all is well with the people of Judah, far from it. For in this section, it is clear that the feared invasion has taken place, that Jerusalem has fallen, not to the Assyrians, but to the Chaldeans, who took the Jews captive and transported them to Babylon. The thing Judah most feared has come to pass, and yet it is not the end after all. It is a beginning. Hear now the words of the prophet in Second Isaiah. In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This second section of Isaiah contains all the beloved passages in which we hear the coming of Jesus predicted. Here is my servant. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Break forth together into singing, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. The prophet sings of a new age to come, and in this age the natural order of the world will be overturned. In the natural order of the old world, predator seeks prey, and death comes too early, and one person's labor produces only fruits for another. In the natural order of such a world, it is nothing but natural for people to fear for their security and look out for only themselves. In the natural order of such a world, it is nothing but natural for people to believe they are on their own. But a new age is coming, and along with it, an invitation. Ho, 
everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Everyone who thirsts. This is an invitation to everyone. God is doing more than rescuing Israel. God is doing a new thing, opening the borders to everyone. I said in last week's sermon that the Jews built a religion on separateness. They drew boundaries around their lives so that they would know how they were set apart as God's people. Now God's invitation breaks down the boundaries. Shockingly, the covenant with David is extended across borders as God declares to Jerusalem, see you shall call nations that you do not know and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. God is offering the people of Judah the chance to be part of something much, much larger than themselves. And even today, God offers the same chance to us. We are invited to the same great feast. Didn't we see today in the gospel reading Jesus offering a feast to thousands without money and without price? Doesn't Jesus speak elsewhere in the gospels of the free invitation to a great banquet? Listen, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But how did they respond? They made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. These are not the responses of people too busy to come to a banquet. These are the responses of people who don't trust the invitation. They make light of it. Maybe they declare that it's a scam. And off they go to chase their own security, which some hope to achieve by labor and the most desperate try to achieve through violence. To accept an invitation requires trust. To accept God's invitation, we first have to trust that God really does offer this generous banquet. And then we have to trust the other human beings who will be sitting with us around the table. And that might be difficult, uncomfortable, because a lot of them will be different from us, and a lot of them will be strangers. Isaiah says they will come from nations that we do not know. But we don't get to approve the guest list or arrange the place cards. All the guests have received the same invitation. And we have to trust that they will pass us the plates and share the food and listen to our stories and care about our lives. And they must trust us to do the same. Only when we trust each other will this great banquet be a success. Only when we trust each other can we be part of something larger than ourselves. Recently, I was talking to a new high school graduate, a nice young man, smart, fit, articulate, and funny. I was surprised and sad to learn that he comes from a difficult background, a fragmented family, broken relationships, the kind of home where trust might be hard to offer. And you could understand how a person might feel the need to look out for himself. But this young man has enlisted in the military where he will have to learn to trust others with his very life. And when I asked him why he enlisted, he said that he wants to be part of something larger than himself. Isn't that what we are all thirsty for? To belong? and in belonging to build a life larger than our own? When we labor to protect our own interests, we spend our labor for that which does not satisfy. 
But when we accept the invitation to God's great kingdom, we join a community larger than life. I believe that Isaiah's call to come to the waters is a call to trust God, to enter into God's generosity, to celebrate God's wild abundance. And I also believe it is a call to trust each other and so become part of God's kingdom, which is much larger than our individual lives. This great invitation is present throughout the Bible. So this morning, I want to go all the way to the end and talk about the book of Revelation. This past week, as part of a wonderful Bible school, Donna Hurt was quizzing the adult class on Bible facts. And she asked about the last words of Revelation, and she pointed out that almost the very last words of the Bible are, Come, Lord Jesus. She asked what that meant to us. And the first thing I thought was, let's eat. <laughs> that turned out not to be the answer Donna had in mind, but I still think it's a good one. Our scriptures are full of images of a wonderful feast, the larger-than-life table fellowship that epitomizes God's kingdom on earth. Why shouldn't the Bible end with a table blessing? Why shouldn't this sermon end with a table blessing? Come, Lord Jesus. Be present at our table, Lord. And give us the trust to be present at yours. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs>